Thank you. Um, thanks for coming, first thing first. Uh, do you know Klein and Zeigen? <laughs> cool, do you use it? Good, good. Klein and Zeigen is uh, Germany's number one marketplace where you can sell items, uh, buy items. It's like a great place to connect with and also trade in a sustainable way. So I'm a senior data engineer in Klein and Zeigen. Um, uh, I work with, uh, at the platform team. Uh, what we do, basically, we help the uh, domain teams to build data pipelines or um, help them to build their own data pipelines. And last year, we had a migration uh, from Hadoop, old system Hadoop uh, data pipelines to a new design. And while designing, we actually made use of some data mesh concepts. And uh, here, the talk is about this uh, migration actually we, we had last year together with the team. And I want to share our experience with you. So first, I want to talk about the legacy pipeline we had in Klein and Zeigen. Um, so uh, you see here the monolith. The monolith is the main backend uh, service of Klein and Zeigen. This is the main platform. Uh, it was emitting uh, analytical JSON events to Kafka cluster. And uh, we have Flume ingester, which consumes those events and ingests to Hadoop Data Warehouse. Um, later, uh, Monolith runs Hive queries to aggregate data and store it in, in MySQL Data Warehouse with some scheduled jobs. So this was what it is. And everything is, you see here uh, was on-prem. The problematic piece was uh, the Hadoop data warehouse. Uh, it was in a very old version, and the maintenance was very costly. So the central teams actually wanted to uh, get away from it. Another problem is uh, the Kafka cluster was, again, the version problem. Um, uh, and the central teams and wanted to shut it down. Uh, the last but not least is the scheduled jobs uh, running from the backend service. They were failing silently, and nobody was noticing. And till we noticed, the data was lost. <laughs> so uh, before diving to um, like, uh, the cloud new design, I want to give you the like, re quick recap about the data mesh, what it is. So data mesh is the decentralized data management paradigm. It's uh, introduced by Zamak Degani. And it has four main important uh, points. Uh, first is domain ownership. It means basically you need to move the uh, analytical data ownership to the domain teams, not uh, central, owned by the central teams. Second is data as a product. Teams, uh, domain teams, should be also responsible for delivering high quality data. Self-serve data platform means uh, tools should be provided and they should be domain ag agnostic and every team can just go and grab the tools and build their own data pipeline. Last but not least, the federated governance means uh, there should be rules or company policies to keep the data, ingest the data, or store the data, including the GDPR rules. So with this in mind, we came up with a new design. Um, it's a cloud-based pipeline now. Um, so it's an ad domain, it is an example domain. Uh, ad means advertisements on Klein and Zagen. So we have a backend service here, ad service, emitting events again with a Kafka topic in Avra format. And um, we store uh, these events in a Kafka cluster. And later, we have a data, link, a data hub sync. And with this sync, it's a uh, uh, a function actually connects to Kafka cluster topics, ingests data into data lake, with also uh, doing some transform like transformation from Avro to Delta format. I will talk to you about what Data Hub means in a minute, so just bear with me. Um, later, we register this data set in order to have a visibility to the other teams. It's a catalog, data cataloging systems. And uh, we need to register the data set we're creating in the data hub. Um, after the registration, we create the tables on top of the registered data set. Uh, because um, uh, in Databricks, uh, 
uh, is our data warehouse, and uh, we create the tables, and we make sure that the raw data is accessible, and um, every data scientist or data engineer can go and uh, check, check out the data. Here, the important part is that we use DBT as a transformation layer. And we uh, run DBT. D DBT is data pool tool, and I will talk to you about it later. Um, so we run DBT uh, functions, DBT, DBT uh, uh, model generation system on Airflow. Um, then DBT generates data marts, right? So we also get this data mart and store back into our S3 data lake. Uh, last points are these are the interfaces that um, uh, data scientists or data analysts can access to uh, Tableau and see Databricks tables and create the dashboards. And another uh, interface is the data catalog again. Other teams can request access and we can grant so that they can uh, see the data, access the data in a managed way. Uh, so here, let's take a look at the tech stack. I also mentioned Data Hub before. Data Hub is a self-serve data infrastructure provided by Adavinta. Uh, Adavinta is our mother company, so it has like several central, central teams. So these central teams actually um, have a LinkedIn open source Data Hub, and they uh, provide managed services with, with this Data Hub. Um, managed service means that um, the maintenance, the uh, entire clusters are taken care of by the central teams. So we be when we basically use Kafka or something else, we are just the tenants of the big cluster. So this big cluster is actually taken care by the central teams. We are just the tenants. And it has several sources, like um, creating data buckets, Kafka, uh, clusters or routing mechanism like a data sync that I mentioned before, or Airflow or anything, uh, any machine learning tools are accessible in Data Hub. Uh, from this Data Hub, we use Kafka, as I mentioned before. Uh, it's, it's under the hood AWS Kafka cluster, but as I said, it's managed, so we don't need to actually care about the uh, Kubernetes cluster or where the uh, Kafka runs, et cetera. We just go there, create our Kafka topic, and see uh, if the data is coming or, um, or there, there is any issues, anything like that. Uh, you can see that it provides a good overview of the Kafka, and you can also uh, visualize anything you want to see with lineage or costs or anything like that. Um, another thing we use in, uh, from Data Hub is data registration. It's a cataloging system. So you go there and uh, register met metadata of your da uh, data set you want to ingest to. And um, you create one S3 path um, per data set. So that this, uh, after registration, you make sure that the data has the privacy coverage or anything, or also data retention periods are set, or you can also define the uh, environment of the data set. Um, uh, the other one is data routing mechanism. It's actually the data sync I mentioned before in our data uh, pipeline. Um, this mechanism actually provides us uh, to in directly connect to uh, Kafka topic, and um, uh, like with UI, we, were, we are able to generate a pipeline, uh, ingestion pipeline uh, to S3 bucket. We also can uh, convert the data from Avro to Delta or any other format um, without any creating an extra job in between. So this is like a, like a kind of in-house service taken care by the, uh, again, uh, central teams. And we just use it to uh, ingest our data in the S3 bucket in our data lake. So this is also a screenshot from, uh, data hub, um, from the data hub where we just created the uh, pipeline and see if the messages are coming. Um, after. Uh, having the data or ingestion layer, um, we need to make this, uh, we need to create the tables 
also in the data warehouse system. In our case, it's Databricks. Um, it's uh, used as a data warehouse in Kleinersagen, and we are supposed to um, use S3 uh, for data lakes. So we are not using here a Databricks uh, file system. We are entirely dependent on S3 buckets. So uh, that's the reason we actually mount the tables on S3 buckets with this script. It's very simple, uh, but we just indicate the format of the data and give the location of S3. Um, DBT is a very important piece, and it's not provided from Data Hub. This is what we uh, actually worked closely on. Um, uh, data Build Tool is actually um, very useful um, for creating a transformation uh, for your data sets. Uh, it gives a cr uh, very version clean, uh, uh, clean version of data um, models, and uh, collaboration on these models are also possible. Everyone can um, access and uh, contribute to the uh, data marts, uh, which also like, uh, gives accessibility for anyone else to see the dependencies uh, after generating the documents and documentations. And um, another important thing is the testing. Uh, you can actually uh, put uh, some um, uh, testing like in a YAML file uh, for the column base. You can um, expect some uh, data sets or data types to be in the data mart. Here, um, so we have uh, some data sources that we generated before. These are like uh, our DBT is connected with the uh, data bricks. And after connection, so we, we are able to define the data sources. So the green things, uh, uh, as you see, are the raw data. Then we have the staging layer where we actually do duplicate the data. Um, and in the March layer, this is the real um, like reporting layer, the data mart uh, creation layer, where we um, generate this uh, with the uh, huge aggregation uh, step. Um, so as I said, we run DBT on Airflow. And Airflow is, again, uh, from the central services. It's a managed Airflow. And um, because it's managed version, we were not able to use uh, DBT operators on Airflow. So we were asked to use uh, Kubernetes pod operator instead. Uh, this means uh, we had to uh, create a Docker image of our DBT module, put everything, the all requirements, all dependency in this uh, image, and then run on um, Airflow with Kubernetes pod operator. So the steps of uh, DBT, if you're familiar, is like you need to run de debug first, and then uh, the tests are run. And then you can execute the staging layer or a mod layer, and it goes on. So um, here uh, we use DBT in Kubernetes uh, pod operator. This is actually a wrapper we created around uh, Kubernetes pod operator. And we use these empty operator just to wait for uh, the other dependencies uh, to be ready uh, for running the next stages. So, um, what I introduced so far, uh, it's, um, so far we came up with some uh, pipeline, okay, so what does it mean for the teams or for the entire um, organization with data mesh? Um, the domain ownership is now can be visible for the teams because we created this uh, uh, domain-based uh, architecture, and but we still uh, actually uh, educate teams about this, what it means uh, ownership. Um, sometimes it's still there's a resistance, uh, so it's our job to uh, organize some workshops and get them into uh, learning some. Uh, DBT, or like, what does it mean having an um, analytical data pipeline in your team? This, these kind of concepts are still lacking, so we need to work on this. Data as a product, actually, we made a step uh, for creating high-quality data. As I mentioned before, DBT gives us a cool, cool uh, tool, let's say, uh, to be able to test document data. And also, um, uh, this is like a 
also domain perspective, giving a responsibility to the teams to generate. And they can also prompt if something is wrong uh, while the generation steps failing or something. Um, Self-serve data platform is already there. It's, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's interesting. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, Self-serve platform already there. So, we use uh, Data Hub. It's provided by Adaventa. Thanks to this uh, Data Hub, we actually managed to get rid of the all uh, DevOps side of uh, services. Like, we just grab them and then build the pipeline in a very frequent, uh, very fast way. Uh, last but not least, the federated governance. Uh, again, we still need to work on this. Uh, provide some rules, uh, company uh, regulations with data guilds, actually. This is kind of needs to be done company wide. And I also want to share some key learnings. <laughs> So um, don't postpone your tech doubt. Uh, because of this, we actually had to handle uh, the very old machines uh, for Hadoop to connect and like uh, copy data to new existing pipeline. It, ha it involved very much um, manual work because of the connectivity issues. Uh, please don't postpone it. <laughs> Do it in time. Um, next one is um, own your data. <laughs> So it's again uh, some some time. There was a like some issue in the pipeline. It was broken for a long time. Nobody noticed, and we had some missing data uh, for quite some actually. Um, test your data. Uh, it's again we had this issue uh, with an important data set. Uh, because of this uh, improper quality check, we actually calculated some SLAs in a. Uh, with the very wrong data, and it cost us money. So, and last is uh, data contracts are important. So, um, uh, in our case, we we had uh, like uh, some schema changes in the uh, in some different domains, and they didn't communicate with each other. In the end, we lost a field, uh, which was very important for data generation. In the end, the, the dependent uh, report was not able to create it. So we had to deep dive into the code to be able to restore this, the uh, code, uh, the, the data. And it was uh, not fun. Um, yeah, central teams don't need to know your uh, domain data. so. You should know um, what you're providing as a data set, and you should take care of this. Again, now, <laughs> time for questions. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I use some buzzwords. If you're interested, I can explain it later. We also have a booth downstairs in the cafeteria. You can also find me there, ask questions about what DBT is or something. <laughs> yeah, question. Yeah. Uh, did you add some new members to product teams, or did they handle their new uh, tasks without additional staff? So uh, that's a good question, actually. We thought that uh, every domain team should own at least one data engineer who knows this concept. Uh, this is what we cannot do at the moment, uh, but we are trying to get some backend engineers on board with this idea, at least get some support from their um, product or project managers, um, and align on these topics that these needs to be taken care of by the domain teams. Thanks. Uh, I have one question. I have seen that you use the uh, here, um, no, um, S3 bucket and yes. uh, here Databricks uh, as for services with Spark. Um, the pricing model from AWS for S3 is a little bit special, especially for output data. Was it a problem for you? Uh, what do you mean output data? Um, when, when you have Databricks as a separated service yes. and uh, S3 buckets yes. from AWS. Yeah, it's uh, not ideal. I am aware of this. Because this is like, um, so uh, we had Databricks way before we have uh, AWS transition. So mm. 
Um, now, at the moment, yes, we use Databricks as a data warehouse, but it will be changed to Redshift as one well, again to S3 um, or no AWS Ooh, yeah. more. <laughs> so uh, yes, uh, Databricks in general is very costly, so yeah. uh, we are aware of this. Um, so to, to manage this cost or to manage the future migrations, we actually uh, decided to keep everything in S3 in order to you know have the have don't have any compatibility issues when we change from Databricks to um, uh, Redshift or something else. So you, in the moment you accept this output, uh, the special output uh, costs from AWS. <coughs> yes, okay. yes, it's uh, Databricks. I, I'm aware Databricks is costly. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I think we're already a little bit over time, um, but if you have any more questions for Aidan, you're very welcome to just catch her after and have a talk with her. Uh, thanks again, Aidan, for the talk. Thank uh, you. Give her a big hand. And... Thanks for coming. <laughs>